Okay, I believe we are live. Um, welcome, welcome to Talk Time featuring Dr. Jeffrey Zeig today. I'm so grateful and happy and excited to have you here with me, Jeff. And let me, before I kind of um, put you on, let me tell the audience a little bit about you, although everyone that's registered knows a lot about you, I think, and are very interested in your work. You are the founder and the director of the Milton Erickson Foundation and travel all over the world, training therapists, working with people. You've authored or co-authored 20 books. They're translated into many foreign languages. And on top of all of that, you also direct and run many conferences. Um, around the United States and also internationally, I believe. The Brief Therapy Conference is where we met most recently. And you just completed, I think, the Couples Conference not too long ago, but you've been such a major contributor to the field of brief therapy and therapy and to therapist training. I so appreciate having you here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you, and thanks for inviting me. Yep, very happy to have you. And I want to invite... Um, all of our viewers as well to ask questions in the chat box as we go along if there's anything sure. that strikes you or have questions. I was in New York this last weekend and several people came up and said, oh, I know Jeff or I've seen him somewhere and I'm so excited to have him on talk time. I don't even know Jeff and I don't get to see him <laughs> often enough. I bet that's probably true. Where are you these days anyway? I know the other day I woke up, I was completely disoriented. I had no idea where I was. I was at home. <laughs> That's what an unusual place to be, isn't it? When Absolutely. you're on the road a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I have that experience myself some days. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be chatting today a little bit about experiential methods to empower therapists. And one of the things you've really devoted your career to is therapist excellence. Uh, you have lots of consult, you have consultation groups that are ongoing. And that's been one of, I think, one of your most fun things that I've heard you describe. And so when you think about empowering therapist excellence, what are some of the things that come to your mind? Sure. So we can learn to be therapists in many ways. One of the ways that we learn is through our graduate education. In our graduate education, mostly what we're learning is theories, we're learning history, we're learning research, and we're learning techniques. Now, if you could do therapy by knowing theory, research, history, and techniques, it would be very easy because those are algorithmic things that you can learn. Those things teach you how to do therapy. Now, that's an emphasis, how to do therapy. Learning how to do therapy, you can learn from a book. Learning how to be a therapist, that's not something that you can easily learn from a book. And that's where you need mentorship. You need somebody who is going to help you to develop the unique qualities that you bring to the consultation room. Now, I started training with Milton Erickson in 1973. I traveled frequently to Phoenix, Arizona to learn from him. In 1978, two years before Dr. Erickson died, I moved to Phoenix to be close to him. So for more than six years, Milton Erickson was my teacher, and he never, as in no time at all, taught me research theories or techniques or history. Never. Never. Now, you have to imagine being with a teacher for that long and him not giving you information. Right. Now, what would you do? Like, put yourself in that position. You're Milton Erickson. You're training Jeff Zeig, and you're not going to give him information, not in the traditional sense. And so what Milton Erickson did is he gave me experiences. And these experiences would help me to be a better Jeff Zeig. Mm -hmm. And the experiences were hypnosis, or they were tasks, or they were fragments of poetry, or they were stories, or they were symbolic assignments. They could have been reading. Things that he gave me that would help to develop aspects of myself. And let's call those aspects of self something. Let's call those aspects of self states. Now, 
if you're going to teach somebody something algorithmic like mathematics or like sciences, then you're giving people information. Mm -hmm. And for example, you're learning geometry and you learn C squared equals A squared plus B squared, and you memorize that formula and you know how to compute the length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle if you know the length of the sides. Now that's a formula, you memorize it. And a problem is being happy in life. Well, being happy in life is not a formula. It's not an algorithm. If it was, we would just all read the Bible or some self-help book and we would be happy. So <laughs> being, we would all be out of work. <laughs> and, and that would be good. Yes, we, it would. We would all be out, out, of, out of work. But fortunately, there's no end to human misery. And seemingly, there are factories that produce nothing but human misery. And yeah, so we much try suffering. to help we try to help people to cope or to change their suffering. Now, um, so uh, it, it gets a little complicated, but I'm trying so to simplify. You are, you're doing a great job um, bringing up the ways that you were alongside mm -hmm. um, Milton Erickson and the ways that he wasn't just transferring information to you, that he began to give you experience and also this idea of states that um, you, we can access with inside of ourselves the, a way of being or acts, a way of being, a way of feeling or yes. accessing particular states. And I guess there's, you know, there's learning states, there's compassionate states. What what are some of the things that, as being a therapist, states are particularly important for me to know how to access? Right. So right now I'm writing Milton Erickson's biography. I got a grant from Jerry Piaget, and uh, he was very kind because he visited Dr. Erickson with his wife many years ago, and uh, he had some money at his nonprofit and donated it so that I could write this grant. Okay, so now this is a matter of finding something excellent and that something excellent is Milton Erickson mm -hmm. and then that's a matter of going shook which is bring it which is then a matter of going ching 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 which is dividing Milton Erickson into states and um, a state that Milton Erickson inhabited was a state of being experiential mm -hmm. so if you asked him a question interpersonally he would respond with an experience rather than necessarily responding with a didactic piece of information because he was interested in helping you to flexibly access adaptive states. Another state that Milton Erickson was in was in a, a state of utilization. Utilization is a state of being response ready ready to respond constructively to whatever exists in the total weave of the therapy situation. Dr. Erickson was in a state of acuity, being alive to the nuances of the moment. He was in a state of orienting toward. So rather than informing with direct information, he would orient toward. Now, some people have called that a technique, and they've called it the technique of being indirect, and they have tried to categorize different ways of being indirect. But what I am maintaining in my recent writing and in this biography is that the state is the mother of the technique. The first thing for the therapist to do is to access constructive states, and then, because we have learned techniques along the way, the technique will become clear once you recognize the state that you can be in as a therapist. Now that could be a state of being compassionate, a state of being interested. But what I am saying, what I'm suggesting is that I'm twisting the definition of state a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that a state is being experiential. So um, well, through a simple example, I'm visiting Dr. Erickson in the early in mid 1970s, and I his house guest, and I'm putting away my clothes, and there's a box of old reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes, and they're uh, 
ancient at that point, reel to reel, and you know, threatened right. with becoming <laughs> vinegar. But their lectures that Dr. Erickson did in the 1950s and 1960s, when he was teaching physicians, there's no psychologists, there's no counselors, there's no social workers. He was teaching and training physicians about using hypnosis when physicians had time to attend seminars like that. And so I said, Dr. Erickson, can I listen to these old lectures? And by the way, can I put them on a more modern format that preserves them for history? That would be cassettes at that time. And he said, sure. Now, he starts his lecture and he's speaking in a, a, a musical, a, a kind of a lilting voice, hypnosis. Yes. Hypnosis has been known and realized. And hypnosis can be realized. And in the blink of an eye, in the, in the way in which you can give yourself the nod to enjoy and appreciate. And suddenly I'm going, oh. <laughs> and I say, Dr. Erickson, I, I listened to this lecture and it was like one long induction of hypnosis. <laughs> And he said, oh, 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 Jeff, I never listened to those old lectures. I, I didn't teach content. I taught to motivate. Now, you have to remember that having spent all of those years in my master's degree, my bachelor's degree, my PhD program, my internship, learning techniques and research and uh, history and um, theories, and suddenly there's somebody who's teaching me and he's teaching because he wants to elicit a state and he's not teaching information. Yeah. Now that was mind boggling to me. I couldn't even begin to wrap my mind around it. And it's only gradually over the years that I began to understand more of the fundamentals of what Dr. Erickson was doing. We get into unadaptive states. If you're an EFT therapist and the client is in an unadaptive state of being disconnected, you want to help that client to get connected. Yeah. Now, if you say to the client, there are four ways of getting connected and you outline these in an algorithmic form, it's nice. But I don't think it's the royal road to help people change states. Yeah, it's not particularly useful, especially in them creating long-term change. And so we do something, you know, we wouldn't call it state change, but it is, you know, when we, yes. think, when we think about it. Because, and we use, we teach a particular kind of a way of being with that helps the clients to calm down and, and change state, feel connected, resonate with us so that that um, new state can enter in the room out of being dysregulated. Right. Although calming down is not my favorite sport and uh, yes, you right. know, the overemphasis <laughs> on uh, down regulation is really not conducive to good therapy. Right. And we need to be able to do things that modulate the level of tension. That's right. But, but That's the essence sad. of Erickson was being um, an experiential to the extreme. So he would spend an hour with students or with clients or two hours creating experiences that would help this person to develop adaptive states. And we should have, you know, like, I'm curious, I don't even know how to Sue Johnson, how to anybody in the EFT community define emotion. What's the definition for emotion? Ah, well, oh, that's that's a great question. We would um, we would talk about emotion in an experiential sort of a way, and probably unpack some of its components. You know, and when we're giving that when we're giving that definition, rather than um, have people experience different emotions while we're trying to teach that. So. Good. Well, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think it's incumbent upon experts to have definitions for hypnosis or emotion or yeah. cognition. And for the most part, I never learned a definition of emotion when I was in graduate school. Nobody taught me how to define an emotion. Well, an easy way to define an emotion is that an emotion is a fleeting, visceral, adaptive experience 
that is directional and it's based on the history of the organism. So emotions tell the organism move toward or move away. Yes. And so then we can understand that emotions are part of our sociobiology, part of our evolutionary sociobiology. Right. And that mostly the problems that people have when they come to therapy are not about emotion because um, emotions are just fleeting visceral adaptive experiences that tell you to move toward or move away based on the history of the organism. Yes. And we do have problems with moods. Now, moods are like calcified emotions. And I'm in a hyper mood, I'm in a frightened mood, I'm in an aggressive mood. Moods don't have adaptive value. And they don't tell the organism how to behave adaptively. Now, most of the problems that people come with, that they come with, they're not in the proper state for being able to accomplish an adaptive task. So we couldn't say that curiosity is an emotion curiosity is a state. We couldn't say that motivation is an emotion. We couldn't say that presence is an emotion. We couldn't say that uh, mindfulness is an emotion, that faith is an emotion. These are states and we transition seamlessly in and out of states. Now, if the client is in a state of apathy, for example, explaining to the client you're in a state of apathy, you need to be in a state of being motivated is not going to be helpful. Okay, now, so the question I, let's, is... Um, let's go back to state, because... Mm -hmm. be, so there's not confusion between emotion and state. And your definition is, of emotion is probably pretty close to what we would use uh, as a definition of emotion. But where, it, you know, I don't want to get into different therapy theories, but I do want to know what your definition of state would be, um, because there are because we would, I would see emotions being able to be in a receptive state around difficult emotion as an important adaptive quality. Yes, being in a receptive state is it would being receptive is a state. Now, you know, if you talk with somebody like Paul Ekman, expert on emotion, he would yeah. probably say that it's, that emotion is a meta category. Uh, that state is a meta category. Right. Emotion. Uh, is, is a kind of state that the organism gets into. That's right. And I'm defining states in a much more loose way because I want to broach from the idea that, yes, apathy is a state and receptiveness is a state, but also orienting toward or utilization or yeah. being experiential, that these can be states. As well as emotion, because emotion or, or provides those orientations as well. So I'm trying to limit the emotion and the mood. Like any emotion can be described in one word, but the emotions, the major emotions, universal emotions would be like surprise and sadness yeah. and grief. Uh, so those, those emotions would be universal across cultures. If you had a culture in Borneo right. that never saw a Western person and you showed them disgust, <sighs> they would know that was discussed. They yes. wouldn't need to have learned that emotion. And some emotions are more learned over the course of time, and some emotions are just programmed into the human system and they're universal. And they just come with the, they come with the packaging. So uh, these states, they're amalgamations of emotions and behaviors and memories and perceptions and history. And we group these things into compartments so that we can make the expression of them easier. Mm -hmm. Now, if we say that our job is less psychoeducation and more experiential, yes. then how are we going to learn how to be experiential? Well, we all know how to be experiential because there's a universe that we inhabit that is exceedingly experiential. And we're experiencing all the time. Yes, and that universe is art. Yeah. Art is about human experience. Mm -hmm. You go to the movies, you go to the theater, you go to the art gallery you, because you want to have an experience and you don't go there because you want to have information. 
You go there because you want to experience different states. So if we want to learn about how to be agents who are experiential and help people to propagate states, we can't study psychotherapists because they don't know this technology. And what we need to study is artists who have a much longer history than psychotherapy because psychotherapy only started in 1885 when Freud became interested in the psychological aspect of medicine. So we need to study Sophocles and Shakespeare and Spielberg and learn how they think. What is the grammar of helping people to change states? And this has been my area of inquiry, mm -hmm. which is to look into the codes that exist across arts that can be used by psychotherapists at, and mothers and lawyers and dentists and Indian chiefs at the moments when they want to have emotional impact. And so then it's a matter of exploring those things. So that we can then help create an environment or do that, help that shift happen in therapy. Well, if you, and in you, ourselves perhaps as well. You want somebody to be receptive. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm working with some people today and an issue was being receptive. So I said to one of the family members, am I being receptive? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, well, what am I doing that lets you know that I am being receptive? And then we agreed that the way that I was positioning my body mm -hmm. and the way that I was gesturing with my hands and the tone of my voice and the speed of my speech and the way that I oriented my posture were all aspects of my being receptive. And then I added to that that my perceptiveness, the way that I was noticing details of his behavior uh, and that I was noticing um, some of his features and the color and the shape of his eyes, that these were all being receptive. Now, what, what I'm doing at that moment is I am sculpting myself for the person that he really wanted to be receptive, to understand receptiveness in an experiential way. Mm -hmm. I wanted the partner to have a visual representation as well of being receptive. Now, that is not going to register in the mind of the target person as a series of techniques that I was doing to be receptive, but it was an orientation that would help him to get receptive here and not just here, not just in his left hemisphere, but really grasp, if we use Stranger in a Strange Land by Heinlein, grok. Yeah. I wanted the partner to grok being receptive. And so now I'm using an experiential technique to deconstruct receptive and to create a visual image. Now, I don't know about your graduate program, but in my graduate program, <laughs> nobody taught me to make psychotherapy into a visual art. No, nobody taught right. me to make psychotherapy appeal to the eyes. And so it is very important to me to appeal to the eyes. Now, while I'm doing that, I'm also going, receptive is, ah, and I'm using sound effects. Now, nobody taught me ever to use sound effects as a psychotherapist, but by the way, this is certainly what Steven Spielberg has been doing for years, and he has an artist called a Foley artist that does nothing other than adds sound effects that are embroidery seamlessly placed into the weave of the art that don't stand out to the recipient of the communication, right. but increase the density of that communication and make it more experientially alive. And so these are the areas that I explore and being experiential is something we all know. 
So if I try to say to a therapist, be more experiential, they say, yeah, well, that's okay, that's interesting. But if I explain, this is what Beethoven does, this is what Spielberg does, this is what Monet does, this is what uh, uh, Robert Frost does, and this is how they create experiential moments to reach the human heart. If you just want to reach the human head, it's a physics, it's mathematics. Yeah. Just give them the algorithm. But when you want to reach the human heart, you have to use a different technique. There's a joke. What's the difference between heaven and hell? Well, in heaven, they tell jokes. In hell, they explain them. <laughs> and psychotherapists have spent an endless amount of time explaining to people about their history or their relationship patterns or their cognitions or their emotions or their attitudes. And uh, I... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, being an information sharer, right, or giver doesn't do much in the way of creating change because that experience, that inside out change is what where lasting change comes. Exactly. Eliciting from the inside out. Yeah. So you've been on a journey of exploring the arts with this in mind about how to be more artful as a therapist, meaning being able to provoke new receptivity, elicit. right? Elicit, mm -hmm. yeah, thank mm -hmm. you, experience with them. And uh, mm -hmm. you've had some, some fun experiences on your journey that have also really impacted you, I think, in the things that you're trying to share with therapists now. Right, well, the most fun experience, the most formative was meeting Milton Erickson. Yeah. And now writing his biography and having interviewed seven of his eight children extensively, and the, uh, the eighth one is just on the queue to, to visit, the best that I can say is that Milton Erickson was 100% experiential. And that when you, you know, if you uh, asked him, do you, you know, want a tuna fish sandwich, I'm sure he would say yes or no. But for the most part, he was radically experiential. For example, I'm visiting Milton Erickson for the first time on December 5th. It was the last day that I was there in that first series of visits, in that first visit. And it's December 5th of 1973. And Dr. Erickson comes in and says immediately that he was in New Orleans and that he went to a restaurant and that he ordered two dozen oysters. And when the waiter brought two dozen oysters, he ordered a third dozen. Now, nobody eats 36 raw oysters, but after he finished 36 raw oysters, he ordered another dozen oysters. Now, the waiter is incredulous because nobody eats 48 raw oysters, but when he had finished them, he ordered a fifth dozen. The waiter was stupefied. Dr. Erickson looked at the waiter and said, 60 oysters for 60 birthdays. Hmm. I said, happy birthday, Dr. Erickson. So he didn't even tell me in a direct way that it was his birthday. Yeah. He created a little drama that would orient me toward an understanding hmm. of the day. Yeah. And now I think that what he was doing was an aerobic exercise. He was practicing orienting toward because this is the purview of art is orienting people toward and not informing people. If uh, Shakespeare says, when to the sessions of sweet silent thought, I summon up this remembrance of things past, he, he's not just saying, well, I was having a wonderful time remembering or a bad time remembering. He is creating a poetic uh, orientation so that the reader, the listener to that poem, gets it. Mm -hmm. And we don't spend enough time in um, learning how to 
uh, how to empower those moments. Now, a lot of psychotherapy could be educating people about the difference between passive, assertive, and aggressive behavior and explaining it to them and giving them a template. And certainly there are people in very regressed ways that, that they absolutely need a template of um, you know, how to understand the world or how to understand interpersonal relationships. But I think more often, what people need is empowering experiences that help them to be different. Now, what I've done and where we started was that I've taken the same idea and I have applied it to training psychotherapists. And rather than training psychotherapists by teaching them history or theory or research or techniques, I look to models of how people learn to be artists. And especially, how do actors learn to do improvisation? Yeah. Because nobody says to the actor, there are three rules for improvisation. But actors learn to be in the state of improvising. And by the way, psychotherapy is closer to improvisation than it is to science anyway. Yes. So, <laughs> so OK, I took a course. And I wanted to see how do actors learn how to do improvisation. And then, oh my gosh, this is like the way Erickson was with me when he was teaching me, giving me experiences that would empower states inside me. Mm -hmm. So then the most recent book that I did is this one, Psychoaerobics. Yes. And the psychoaerobic model, these are 60, with multiple variations, 60 exercises that can be used by therapists in groups and sometimes individually to train themselves to enter into adaptive states to be the best therapist and also orient them to an experiential approach to psychotherapy rather than a didactic approach. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, nobody listens to me. <laughs> It doesn't stop me, it doesn't phase me in the slightest, but uh, to try to find um, an audience of people who begin to understand that a psychotherapy can be a totally experiential model, totally experiential model. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's something that um, therapists haven't been prepared for and they haven't been oriented to, so I'm really trying to uh, um, swim upstream against uh, historical currents. Well, it's a really interesting thing to, I consider myself a pretty experiential therapist and uh, an experiential trainer as well, but it certainly is a mix of experience and information, um, much more than, you know, I'm thinking about you and the oyster story, you know, mm -hmm. and I would have to think about that. You know, if I was like, oh, I want someone to know my birthday or my age, and I don't want to just tell them, you know, I'm like that would to even kind of have that as a starting place. That's to a great starting experience, place. right? Excellent starting place. Yeah. Yes. And we yeah. don't necessarily start there, you know, like, Oh, how would I pass this information in an experiential way? But, but actually, that's a, a very, you're saying that's a great place to start. Yes. What do I want to communicate? What is the delivery system that I can use to communicate that idea? And sometimes, like Erickson could, Dr. Erickson could have told me it was his birthday, but I think that he was really exercising a way of communicating in which he would orient toward and keep supple a state that he had developed over a lifetime of practicing psychotherapy. It's this is that. And the simplest way of thinking about that is a metaphor. Mm -hmm. If Shakespeare in Romeo and Juliet would have said, have Romeo say, you know, Juliet, well, she's really beautiful. She's got wonderful eyes. She's got a great smile. She's got beautiful teeth. She's got great skin. She's really <laughs> intelligent. And she's very nice to people. We would never remember that. That's right. She, but she Romeo like says a, a hundred other Juliets. Well, but when Romeo says, you know, Juliet is the sun. All right. Right. We remember that. And the metaphor is a delivery system 
because, by the way, a hundred readers might have a hundred somewhat different interpretations of Juliet as the sun, but we all get it about what is the emotional meaning. Mm -hmm. So the process that you imagine is just what you said. Shakespeare's thinking, what do I want to communicate? What is my delivery system? And in this case, the delivery system is a metaphor. Now, I'm sure that Shakespeare didn't have to think about that, that he had developed the state inside himself of being metaphoric after so much practice that it just flew out of him, Juliet is the sun. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of us, we might have to start at point A and think, what is the message? What is the delivery system? Mm -hmm. Right. We might have to start there and develop that. And one of the things that you did as this, I mean, I don't know when this all became more conscious to you, but you did take a, an improv class to, to explore other ways of other delivery systems, I guess. Yes. And well, uh, other, or the way a model for how to train from uh, a bottom up approach yeah. rather than a left hemisphere down approach yeah. Actors' improvisation is taught from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I did, taking three acting courses, and that was quite a while ago, 20 years ago, is that I started to buy a shelf of acting books, acting exercises. Uh, and these are little experiences that actors are given so that when suddenly they get on stage, they are in the state that they need to be to in, in be into in order to act acting is basically reacting it's a state of reacting to your partner and if you start to act your toast and you've lost the moment you're reacting and you need to be in that receptive reacting state in order to be good at your craft mm -hmm. but that is not something that necessarily everybody has nor is it something that can be just developed by giving somebody C squared equals A squared plus B squared. It's something that you would develop over time and practice. And if you had some disposition for that, you would be able to develop it by doing mass practice in some related way. Yeah. One of the, one of the questions that comes up a lot when I'm training therapists is this question about our own reactivity coming alive in the room, you know, like, oh no, the client or the clients are doing something or other and they're in, you know, tension. They have some sort of um, state or emotional experience that's happening and the client or the therapist gets reactive to that. And mm -hmm. so I think one of the artful things about being a therapist is, is that, flexibility that you're describing um, to be responsive or to create within ourselves that responsiveness uh, instead of shifting into reactivity. Right. And, you know, we are in a very bizarre profession where we spend hours in intimacy when the rest of the population of the world probably spends minutes in intimacy over the course of their day. And we spend hours in intimacy. So, yes, our reactivity um, can be meaningful and can be used meaningful, mm -hmm. meaningfully. And it could be something that you yes. would turn into a story or something that you turn into dialogue. Or if I was in the place of your partner and you communicated that, I might feel like I was a, a puddle and I might feel like melting. I might feel like I would just uh, evaporate and suddenly I, I'm trying to use my reactivity and I'm in a state of utilization where I don't have to be in the traditional Joyce Brothers therapy posture. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Does it remind you of your mother? <laughs> you know, so, you know, therapists are entitled to use their reactivity. They're entitled yes. to use their body. They're entitled to use their voice. They're entitled to use sound effects. They're yeah. entitled to use props. We're not, maybe not only entitled to, but it feels imperative that we're able to use ourselves as that tool within the therapy. 
we don't explore our medium. We don't explore the capacities of our medium. Imagine a painter who is just painting in one color. And we have a palette. We have an extensive palette of prosody and uh, tone and tempo and hesitations, pauses, uh, using our breathing, using proximity, using gestures, using posture. And one of the things that Milton Erickson did was he explored using all of the different output channels of communication mm -hmm. to have an effect. For example, the president of the American Psychiatric Association was visiting. The patient was known to have motion sickness. Now, Dr. Erickson was doing a hypnotic induction, and it was a neutral induction, like maybe he was just talking about simple relaxation. But as he was doing the induction, he started to move and sway from side to side, mimicking what it might feel like to a listener who was on a boat. Yeah. Now the patient had his eyes closed, but the patient developed motion sickness. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Erickson wanted to demonstrate that the locus of voice alone, the direction of voice alone, was a sufficient cue to cause a physiological response. And by the way, this is way before the time that we had the concept of a mind-body connection. Mm -hmm. So he was exploring how could you use all of the nuance of communication. And one of the states that Dr. Erickson was in was being very, very, very precise. Dr. Erickson was using the total weave of communication in the same way that a surgeon would use a scalpel, a neurosurgeon would use a scalpel, so that every word was chosen and the gesture and the timing and the tempo and the posture and, uh, and the prosody of voice. Mm -hmm. Now, the effect of that was, I never felt so loved in my life. But it wasn't that he was doing it with me. This is who he was. Mm -hmm. And that he was recognizing as uh, that he would use his communication channels to their maximum extent. And fortunately, he had a lot of RAM. He had a lot of uh, memory that he could work with, mm -hmm. you know, his own particular genius. So he was capable of monitoring a lot of things at the same time. Now, I'm lucky if I can do that in spurts, but I try yeah. and, I, and I think about it. And I think about what is it that I want to communicate and how can I use the total weave of who I am to communicate that when I want to have emotional impact. Yeah. And so precision is a state that I try to emulate. It's not a technique. It's a way of being in the world as a communicator. Yeah. So there's a there's a couple questions that are coming in. Sure. Um, so Lynette is asking if you could make some comments about utilizing this approach with individuals with autism or on the Asperger's or on the spectrum somewhere. That um, her experience is that emotional memory or learning is quite impactful with neurotypical individuals and but maybe it feels like there might be some hindrance in utilizing um, how that to impact emotion. I think if I'm reading right. the question correct. Right. Well, thanks for the for the question. Working with Asperger's and autism spectrum disorders is not a special area of my expertise, but the idea is meet the client at the client's frame of reference. Yeah. And every client has some talent, some something that they can do. And you build your self-esteem about being good at something. And if the only thing that you can do is play a guitar, you can make a very good life if you can do that really, really, really well. So it's finding, not focusing on the deficit, but finding the asset. What does this person bring that can be used and then in the communication pattern, I would try to uh, speak autism. I would try to join into the person's world and try to meet them where they are and then try to communicate with them in a way that was basically autistic. 
but I would try to also begin to weave that into something that was artistic and not just autistic. Mm -hmm. And that uh, it's a way of being with people and I'd wanna know what is it like? And I wouldn't try to be trying to mirror the person in a parody, but I would try to try to want, I just wanna know what is that experience like? What is it like to be there? and try to see if I can establish a channel of communication that emulates that person. No different than when I was working with severely disturbed schizophrenic people and I would talk schizophrenic with them and we would have a back and forth conversation. Sometimes we'd have a competition at who could speak schizophrenic best. Mm -hmm. And I was just entering into their world. Yeah. Uh -huh. But the problem is not autism. Right, I wouldn't use that as a presenting problem and I wouldn't get confused by the diagnostic label. What is the situation that you want to help this person adapt to? How is it that you want this person to develop whatever gifts they're given and use those to live in a way that is um, satisfactory to them? All right, she says she loves that answer, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Okay, and Ron asks if this experiential approach is relate, relational in nature and then used to, to co-create meaning, to create connection. Yes, yes, and it's, it's, the, it's the finding the virtue and the fault. So there's certainly one of the most famous of Dr. Erickson's cases is a woman who comes to him. She's in quite desperate straits. And one of the problems that she has is she's very embarrassed about a gap in between her teeth. And through the interview process, Dr. Erickson finds out that there just happens to be at the place where she works a man who often shows up at the water cooler. Mm -hmm. Now, through a long process, he teaches her, has her learn, among many other things, how to squirt water through that gap in her teeth. And eventually he leads her to the idea that when this man shows up the next time at the water cooler, she is to squirt water at him and run quickly in the opposite direction. Well, the man runs after her and kisses her in the office and they start establishing a relationship. And rather than analyzing the deficit or talking endlessly about how this woman is victimized by her problem, he finds a way of turning straw into gold. Erickson was the quintessential Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> he would weave straw into gold and he would find something that was useful. That's everything a beautiful metaphor. That he, everything <laughs> that he did was relational at a time when being relational was not part of psychotherapy. You, you described, remember, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I remember that Erickson is practicing in the 1950s, 1940s, and he has a psychoanalyst, Lawrence Kuby, who's helping him to get his articles published in psychoanalytic journals, because those are the journals that existed. And yeah. so psychoanalysis at that time was certainly not relational. It was everything in the box. Yeah. And Erickson's solutions were things that had to do with relationship. For example, I was interviewing his daughter recently. She's a therapist in Texas. And um, she was a little traumatized when she was a kid because she wanted to get into the accelerated Spanish program and she wasn't accepted. And she explained her conundrum to her father and her father suggested to her, well, why don't you volunteer to work in the, hosp in the, uh, in the school cafeteria? Well, she says, okay, and she starts working in the school cafeteria. Now, suddenly, after some period of time, she realizes most of the people in the school cafeteria are speaking Spanish. And she starts to learn Spanish by immersing herself in the conversation of her volunteer activity. Now, Dr. Erickson didn't say, well, there are other ways of learning Spanish. He just helped her to get into a relational experience where she could accomplish her goals without the mediation of having to think about step one, two, three, four in order to do that. And suddenly she would discover to her own delight that there are other ways of learning Spanish, but that is a realization and not information. So as a follow-up to that, uh, Ron, who asked that question, um, I might he he said the oyster example mm -hmm. um you know it i i said i'd have to be thinking about that to mm -hmm. 
to create that experience, right? And his his uh, comment was it felt it did it. He he didn't ask it as a question, but he said maybe it seemed kind of orchestrated. Does did that feel relational? So yeah, certainly did. It it. Relational to you oh, to gosh. share that. Oh, the oh, 60 you know, oysters with him absolutely relational it was told to me i was the only person in the room yeah. and it was told with delight yeah. and it was like you know yeah i mean i suppose you could you know draw a line on a piece of paper and call it art but the intricacies of picasso drawing lines on a piece of paper and making simple lines come alive perceptually dimensionally is uh, the art of embroidering something. And when you take something simple and you embroider it with so many other potentialities, it makes something that is simple into something that is really beautiful. So it was, if I, if I said it in a way that sounded contrived, I apologize. No, so it, it was a delightful a experience life. for you. Uh, yes, it was, it, was delightful. it was an illustration <laughs> of yeah. getting an idea deciding on a delivery system and making something come alive in the moment rather than just giving forgettable information now yeah. you know he may have been manipulating me because for the next six years i sent him oysters every birthday <laughs> he got through to you what he really liked anyway and what day was important <laughs> Well, it was a powerful experience. That's the that's the point memorable. of it, right? It's a very yeah, memorable. memorable, powerful experience. Yeah. And I think uh, so. Patrick says the metaphor becomes the delivery system. That's the metaphor the is the delivery that system. Thinking. That's and one delivery system. That's one delivery system, uh, metaphor. And then, of course, all of our nonverbals, using ourselves in that way, being hmm. careful about all our voice, vocal tones, and mm -hmm all the nonverbal things. And then um, he makes this comment that it seems like our vulnerability our, as therapists, if we're ourselves vulnerable and we're looking to create emotional or connected experiences, uh, maybe in couple therapy, for example, that, that our vulnerability creates that delivery system. Can, uh, that's the helping point. helping other people to have that awareness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the state, getting into the state, allowing yourself to be vulnerable sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that that state will be the mother of, of a technique that you have already practiced in your repertoire. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really fascinating to think about the, the delivery systems of creating experience and right and hypnosis people to have is a delivery system yeah and the injector is not the medicine but you need the injector and so the number of delivery systems are infinite and if you look at a movie from 10 years ago it looks like child's play compared to a movie in 10 years into into that into that future that's right. that that, uh, that that directors have learned to embroider their delivery system much more elaborately to make the emotional part of the message come alive. Yes, much more impactful. We can go in and watch watch a movie in 3D now exactly. and have the chair shake and exactly have a full really close to full experience. And they're just getting started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Movies started later than psychotherapy. Movies are much more recent, are more recent than psychotherapy. So when we are with ourselves, working on being more flexible or adaptive, responsive, yeah. Beautiful. what are some of the things that you really have found in your own practice and mm -hmm. as you work with hundreds of um, ment mentees yourself, mm -hmm that are experiences to that are helpful for practice or is it really more no, self-constructed no, no, no. no it's like having a orientation of the month like this month i'm working on using prosody and the tone of the musical nature of my voice mm -hmm. and this month i'm working on using gestures 
and this month I'm working on utilization, and this month I'm working on orienting toward, and this month I'm working on strategic development, and putting these things into my working memory for some period of time until they slip seamlessly into my procedural memory and I don't have to think about them again. But I, I would lay out in my mind a series of states that I wanted to develop and then being metaphoric could be one. Yeah. And then I would just practice with every session using one metaphor. It's like, maybe I'd have to prompt myself by using a simile, it's like, yeah. and I would just keep on saying in a session it's like, and I would trust that something will come out of my mouth after I prompt myself by saying it's like. And then after doing it's like for a while, I might practice, um, using a metaphor and just Juliet is the sun. If Shakespeare said Juliet is like the sun, it wouldn't have had the same effect. Yeah. So that's one way of transitioning, one way of helping people to develop states. Mark out, decide what states there are that you want to develop and begin to um, practice those. Not only, I mean, if you, you know, like if I'm, practicing uh, acuity and uh, I go into the convenience store and I talk with some clerk for a little while and I say, you're a middle child, aren't you? <laughs> and I'm just practicing developing my inferential skills because I decided that I wanted to practice developing inference. And so I you know, could do that for a month and see what I could learn about developing my brain in uh, and developing aspects of my brain uh, to be more in be, to be to to ma to get into the states that I think are important for me. Yeah. I can't tell every therapist what states they should be in, but what states are important for you to develop if you're an EFT therapist. What states are important for you to develop if you're a CBT therapist or a DBT therapist? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's lovely. So to kind of consider the therapy that we're doing, the um, flexibility that we want to create and the delivery system that we want to use and then kind of break out that delivery system metaphor, for example, or our nonverbals and, and practice those, break them into little pieces and practice them. Exactly. And it's, it's no, no different than a concert violinist practicing scales. So the art becomes artistic and fluid, mm -hmm. and it, that takes practice. Mm -hmm. It takes moving something from your working memory, like at one time you had to think about tying your shoes, that had to be in working memory, but quickly it drops into procedural memory and you don't even remember tying your shoes. You don't have to use much of your brain for that anymore once it's in your procedural memory. Yeah, that's lovely, it's a, that's a lovely way to put a framework around all of that because that is that puts us right to what we know about humans and learning and being in receptive states where we can more quickly move things from working memory to procedural memory because that happens not only with practice but with that with the strength of the emotion that that moves more quickly into um, that procedural memory right yeah. So this has been delightful. I really, I'm really appreciative of having the opportunity because it really helps me to clarify some of my own thinking, to uh, use you as a foil and to see if some of my ideas work for you and for your listeners. So I'm, I'm really grateful for having this uh, moment that I can bonk. I, I so appreciate you being here. I have one, I know we're close to time or we're at time, but can I ask you one other quick question before we go? Oh, why not? I think it'll be quick. Um, many times when I see you speak, you've done it here today, and when I've met you in person, you have this great little nonverbal that you do with just ch -ch 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 -ch, mm -hmm. right? Good. And, and is that, so describe what that means. Well, if I was doing that would be yep. creating experiences. If I was doing this, it would be utilization. If I was doing dee 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 it would be being strategic. If it, so, if, so for each of the states 
that are important to me in studying Erickson, I have a little gesture and sometimes a sound that try, that that is an embroidery to impress on your auditory and visual memory that state so that when it comes to that moment in which you might want to practice that, then uh, you have that more easily available to you uh, and you can practice being in that state. Yeah. This is create experiences. You know, you could watch Erickson for an hour and for one hour being with a couple rather than giving them information, rather than commenting on any aspect of their experience, he's just giving them experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't do that. I, I'm lucky if I can do that 20% of the time in the session. But come back next year, I'll do it 25% of the time. Well, even doing it 20% of the session is going to create a lot more change than, you know, that's going to so. create, help create change, having that experience. And it's been a delightful time My to pleasure. My have pleasure. you Thanks on with us. Me. Thank you so much. And I'll send people, uh, any of you, if you want to look into what you're doing, Dr. Zeig, they'll go to the ericksonfoundation.org. The link is in the browser now. And your books and where you are, what's coming up, mm -hmm. uh, how to be in touch with you is all right there. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, everyone.